Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry for the uh, slight delay in here, a couple minutes. Uh, but we'll get started uh, with a very exciting uh, contribution today from uh, Dr. Ishan Rao from Shell, and uh, he's also affiliate uh, faculty here in the uh, chemical and biological engineering uh, department at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, um, a lot of you uh, probably have heard or know uh, Ishan. Uh, he has been with Shell since uh, 2013 uh, after having graduated here from uh, the Colorado School of Mines uh, with his PhD. Uh, he got uh, his uh, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, back in, in India. Uh, Ishan uh, it is uh, currently the floor assurance engineer for all the Shell's uh, Gulf of Mexico assets. He provides primary support to green fields, brownfield projects, spares, uh, technology development interventions, and mitigating short-term threats. Um, we are really pleased to have Vishan in here uh, to share some of his uh, experience. Uh, and uh, I think uh, um, this is going to be quite uh, uh, informative to the community. Uh, on our personal level, I uh, want to say that working with Sean over the year has been a pleasure and uh, he's a type of person who uh, um, really uh, tries to make a difference and, and I think this is reflected on his work and, and uh, what he's going to uh, present to you here. So without further ado, uh, Ishan, the floor is yours. Here. Thank you, Dr. Song. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. For some reason, uh, I'm not able to get the camera working. It still says that. Uh, make sure your camera is powered on. I'm on my laptop. Uh, we'll see to it later on. It's always good to see the faces when you're doing these presentations uh, over distance, but it's okay. So folks, um, I my, my, my goal was, first of all, my goal is not to have a meeting which is a one way traffic. And uh, um, there's, I definitely don't want to be in a preaching mode. I would really, really appreciate uh, if this could be not a 30 minute or a 40 minute talk followed by questions. Um, I find it far more interesting when uh, there's a question um, I'm talking, talking about something and you guys, um, anything that's, if not bothering, if there is curiosity right there, uh, I would be very open to host those questions um, right away. Um, I feel that's the fun, that's where all, all, all the magic happens rather than um, waiting for the moment towards the end. So that, that's how I would prefer. Um, oh, on that end, uh, if people have questions, comments, uh, send to the chat and then I can convey that uh, to uh, Ishan. Perfect. Um, the title, Accidental Hydrate Management. Uh, I know <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is an internal term back in Shell, which is used called Advanced Hydrate Management. I'm pretty sure several other companies also uh, have that portfolio. Um, however, one, play, one place I have not worked in Shell is the R&D business and um, in operations. The first thing that I realized was not everything is planned for. Sometimes you are presented with an experiment in the field. You didn't want it, you didn't wish for it, but then you try to make the best out of it. Um, and that's why I've uh, put it in the form of uh, accidental hydrate management. Uh, things that we learned, things that were, something was planned, but something else happened. That's the goal. Um, and uh, our understanding between what we have seen in the field versus what we see in the lab has also changed due to these um, so-called experiments that happened in the field. Yeah. Um, let me see how far this one. Okay. Um, the approach that I am taking today um, is. So there's no, there's not going to be actual field data because you can realize to get those things um, addressed and passed from our ER and all of those aspects would have taken me so much so that the whole, I, I probably would not be able to present today. So 
keep all of that in place and still be able to talk about how what I have seen personally uh, in the field. Uh, for me, the best way to go forward was um, have that have this discussion. Um, if I could make some cartoons, if I could just present something that has been summarized already, um, that, that's, the, that's the way I could think of. Um, I am not going to give away <laughs> a, a particular strategy in a way that I just don't want to present, okay, this is the operating guideline or shell. That's, that would just be not accepted. Uh, however, what I really want to do today is maybe have a discussion with you all where where, where you guys think what's if we are asking the right questions if there is if we are identifying the right threat and are we mitigating in the right fashion so the theme that you will see in these questions is um and this is something that i always follow and i very keep it very close to my heart is um the first step is always risk identification are we doing it the right way um, and i can tell you from my experience um, most of the times, it's the first and the third part where if you fail. We are pretty, as engineers, we are very good at quantification. Trust me, um, we will take our best guesses. Yeah. Even if we don't have the data, we will take our best guesses. And generally, uh, the machine learning pattern through which we have gone through in our brain, we are able to do this quantification still uh, in, a, in a much better fashion. It's the risk identification. That is either we've completely missed that this could have happened. That's the risky zone. Or an engineer thinks, or an R&D person, or somebody thinks there is a risk. There is a meeting ongoing where impressions and uh, do you have the platform to speak up or what you meant versus the pressure from the other leadership, the whole communication of what the person at the ground sees the risk versus what was put in place, that chain, that's the one that I have seen uh, the biggest problems in. So uh, in those aspects, if you have any questions when we are going through the presentation, please feel free to ask. Um, but uh, what have I done is uh, put this whole thing in form of questions uh, and then we can all discuss together. So my end goal will be achieved of this presentation today. If this does inspire you to go back into your company slash uh, institution slash um, uh, discussion boards. Uh, and if you can try and see, are we doing the right work? What, I, what do I need to do to get to the answer? That's, that's probably the first step. And once we identify that, all it takes is resources and planning. And trust me, we can get to those answers. Um, so the idea would be, where am I conservative? Can, can, I, can I go back to the board and identify what's the work that I need to get to somewhere? Um, or if you are able to go back and convince your company or again institution and, and, and I'll be willing to go on a collaboration journey, um, I can tell you from Shell's perspective, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure uh, if I go back five or seven or eight years ago, people would have a very different perspective of how Shell operates and what they want to discuss and what they're not. Um, I can only talk about the current state. I believe that we are all at least in Shell of a same thought process as of now, which is the third bullet. These IP things <laughs> are, are cool, are important, that's okay. But the only way it's useful is when everyone is using it. Um, the only way it gets out to the world. And then uh, most of the places, all the companies are partners. These, I personally don't feel that these are literally IP uh, aspects. Uh, more of these strategies are implemented on more of the assets everyone is producing uh, in, 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 um, in higher quantities. So it, for me, it's always a win-win situation. So go back to your companies, see who's, who's willing to talk who's willing to share it. it's not it's never a one way traffic <laughs> and 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 hopefully we can we can get to a better place yeah uh, so where does the risk lie and i'm assuming and i've I'm, i've taken it for granted that it's it's everything's going to be high rates today right um, 
So starting point is Wellbore is are we identifying always the right patterns, right? So Wellbore could be that position where the risk could happen. Um, and then we have subsea jumpers, right? We could have uh, jumpers connecting to Manifor. We could have jumpers connecting um, to a single flow line. So followed by that would be our flow line piece, right? Um, and as mentioned, um, a subsea system would have a very dis risk, different risk profile to a direct vertical axis, so DVA wells, right? So, so what are those risks? How are they different? Uh, can we learn from somewhere and apply it to the other place? And finally, um, uh, top sides as well as export lines, um, we've seen risks right across boarding chokes, uh, definitely export lines and something that I will, I will talk about also. So it's always tracking the molecule is something that we follow. Um, so where does the risk start and how does that risk travel? Um, different sections, uh, how do we treat them differently? Just want to take, a, I guess, a five second break if anyone has any questions to this point. All right. So certain um, technologies, I believe that of the top four are already published um, in external journals um, or conferences. Um, the fifth one, which is the wellbore hydrate management is something that we've also developed. Uh, so these are our top technologies that are deployed, developed. Uh, it's, uh, we, are pretty, we are pretty good at it. Uh, once this is like the portfolio wide technology that we follow. There are several others that are ongoing, which have very limited um, deployment. Uh, and I've not listed those as of now, but um, I would use this word hypro in future, which is the hydrate plug resistant oil, um, which is naturally occurring surfactants in the oil that work like what your anti-agglomerant would do. Um, kinetic space, note as time extension. This is um, going beyond the thermodynamic boundary of hydrate, hydrate curve. And then um, having a chat <laughs> with the kinetics of the hydrate formation. So you're basically negotiating at that point of time. Hey, what are your conditions? Am I okay to come out of it? And then, um, so all of those is based on, um, can we, can we sit in our hydrate conditions given we will have some sort of a subcooling or a driving force? So what sort of driving forces are okay? That's the technology. Um, so when I talk about driving force, then we go into the, the hydrate management piece again, which is um, low GOR hydrate management. GOR, we believe has a role to play because it's part of the driving force, how much gas is available. Um, so that's the gas limited portions. Then finally, there's the low water cut um, when your system is water limited. Yeah. And the end piece is how does one look at the well bore? What's the right way of risk profiling well bore? And we do have a methodology. Um, and, and finally, we believe we are in a very advanced state of when it comes to well bores, we understand the risk very well out there. No questions? Awesome. Yeah, and I'm assuming somebody will talk or put it in the chat and Dr. Soon will just ask me the question. That's how it's going to be. Okay. So the way I thought we'll talk about is again, follow the molecule. So I'll start with well bore. Um, we will discuss some points. I'll ask some questions, and then we will again come back to the board and, and start putting them down. And hopefully, people will be able to identify: um, Am I doing the right thing? Have I done the risk profiling right? Have I identified the risk profile? Have I quantified it in the right fashion? So, I would say um, 
this was my first time when I got interested in in looking at well bores. Uh, and if I'm not wrong, this was 2014 or 2015 um, OTC presentation from from BP. Um, and trust me, I don't shy away from who I have learned from. It doesn't <laughs> it doesn't put you any 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 in any lower capacity or anything. This was the first paper that I saw that people are actually pushing the boundary when it comes to well bore. So what you're seeing, uh, and if if anyone from BP is online, please correct me if I'm saying anything wrong about this paper. But the bottom line was um, they had done great work on the thermodynamic piece of it, where uh, given a condition, given a GOR, what they said was, um, I have this much water cut, this is my GOR, and this is my thermodynamic hydrate volume fraction curve. So, this is the maximum I can form. And I am willing to push the boundary and I want to see what's going to happen. So if you follow all the GOR curves, let's say from, from bottom to the top. So this is a 2000 GOR curve, which tells you that the maximum hydrate fraction that could be formed in this system. Yeah. Um, and so you are tracking. So you, you can see that hydrate volume fraction itself goes through a peak. Uh, and this is a thermodynamic limit, mind you. This is not kinetics. This is not uh, fluid. We are not even looking at how fluids might uh, um, you know, uh, put themselves in the well bore. So, and what they are showing is how in different wells they were a keep they were able to be in hydrate conditions for much longer than what the earlier issue was. And another thing was this was this was two way thing. This was uh, operators having less time to be able to treat all the wells. Um, so that was the starting point. And then when they collected a couple of data points, they said that why not we push the boundary? So in all of these tests, if I may call, or the experiments that they did in the field, there was just one data point that plugged. Yeah. So for me, it was a very, it was an eye opener as to when we cut water in 2013, if I would say, we would treat the wells, right? But what this paper was showing was people are pushing the boundary. So this got us thinking. So how are we quantifying the risk in well bores, right? Um, if anyone's willing to share how they do it in the company, um, that would be great. Else I'll wait for five seconds and I can talk about how we used to do. Anyone? Uh, Ishan, Jeff, Creek uh, uh, just made a comment in here. Just, I guess uh, it's good to share that a lot of people think uh, there's a lot of more information available in the field than actually is data. It says first find the plug, second how do we get treatment to the plug? Um, sorry, I got distracted. Now I was trying to open up the chat. And uh, Carlos asks, uh, can you talk a bit more about the reason of these peaks in the plot? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, definitely, Carlos. So, because these are thermodynamic curves, what happens is given the GOR in the system, uh, what this tells you is that there is a point beyond which you actually are dividing the system off. So, at, at low GORs, there is not enough gas. So, it doesn't matter how much water you keep putting in, that gas can only form this much amount of hydrates. And this shows you that the whole limiting piece. So, uh, so I guess a GOR of 250, which is the bottom one blue, it peaks at 15% and comes down. So thermodynamically, it's just not possible for that in that particular system to go beyond 15% hydrate volume fraction because you are gas limited at that point. Uh, that was one. And I'm not able to see um, uh, Jeff's chat. Dr. Soom. So was that was there a question for me in that? 
I think it was more of a comment. Uh, okay. Uh, he, he sent directly to me. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, um, well, back in early days, it was simple for us for DVA wells. Uh, we do have a guideline of 5% water cut, uh, 6%, 7%, like depending on a particular well below which you don't have to do anything in the well bore. Uh, it's just not a magic number. And this is 2013, right? So once we go beyond that particular low water cut number, we would treat the well bore. That's it. That's how we used to quantify our, our risk in a DVA well. Um, then we started looking at this paper and then we started thinking on how much higher volume fraction you can form or not flood. Um, so Pat, good morning. Uh, so this has been one of the, uh, I don't know, this has been one of the silver bullet we've been after. Even in grad school, we used to go after this number. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have stopped doing it. I really have. This is, uh, this I think is far more relevant for a flow line restart than anything else. I don't think I can, at least I could apply it anywhere, which is the high rate, what high rate volume fraction is. Okay. But I, yes, for, um, for a restart in, uh, in a flow line, I do think this plays a role. Um, and if I have to talk about it, given the system, given the GORs and whatnot, um, I would not bet on anything that's greater than 20%. Okay, so just good. kind of a question of, so like if you're below 30% volume, hydrate fraction, thermodynamically limited, feel comfortable in that region, if you have thermodynamic limits, say you can get 60% volume fraction, not comfortable. Okay, okay, just from this paper? Yeah. So yeah, what we learned from this paper is that high GOR and high water cut is a problem. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, again, so yeah, I did not try to say 30, 40, 50, what works. I just saw a pattern here that there is a high GOR fluid and it, when it is exposed to a high water cut system, it's clearly showing me that there could be an issue. Okay. So this plot was BP, right? This is yep. not what I did. Uh, I, think I was trying to figure out how you were using. Yeah, that yeah. Data. So this this is exactly how I used it. High GR is an issue, and uh, high water cut is an issue. But what do I need to do? Because this is my gut feeling, right? But what do I need to do to be able to go through a whole technical program? and then convince operations or operators to be willing to take that risk. That was the challenge. Yeah. So gray area is 22%. However, even with 5% water cut oil line from the nice flood. I, Taras, can you? Uh, elaborate. Yeah, I think Taurus is on mute. We can get back to it. But my strategy out here was, uh, I think this is the first thing any flow assurance engineer does learn about hydrates is uh, four things that, that gets you uh, to the point where, what do I need to do? how do those hydrate plugs could form, right? So gas, water, temperature, pressure. I need all these things to be able to form hydrates, right? So starting from this, so it's about what do we know about DVAs? What do I know about their location, their drilling patterns? How do DVA slots work, right? So what are my temperature profiles? Uh, for a DVA system, the riser, flow line, and well bore is pretty much a single tubing, right? It's the temperature profiles. So where is the temperature profile different? So that got us thinking. Um, so there has to be a different uh, risk assessment or risk identification in the piece above the mud line and below the mud line. 
just because we have different ambient temperatures starting, right? Then if you are lucky for whatever reason, uh, do you have any measurement inside the well bore? Any measurement, any sort of measurement at any point of time, yeah? Um, if you do, trust me, go back and see what those pressures or temperatures are telling you. We for, uh, I think we had fiber optics available on a few well bores and temperature was the last thing that we were reporting. We were not even looking at it. We had uh, completely different plans for that. Uh, I think this was around identifying which zones are we producing and, and how those zones, what is the health of those zones? Um, how's that happening, right? So we got some, un we were surprised. That's all I can talk about things, right? So which, and I guess I, I'm, I'm asking those things in a question form. Uh, as a flow assurance engineer, when you are looking at DVA wells, uh, I guess this is a question to the community. Anyone can answer. Do you always use linear geothermal profile for risk assessment when it comes to below mud line? Anybody? Uh, depends if you've got salt or not. Yeah, and it does depend on what sort of information you actually do have. We, we do have some fields where we may have some operating uh, measurements, like you mentioned, uh, some sort of fiber optic measurements downhole or something, and, and we've used those as well. Right. Um, so thanks for that information, Doug. Were you surprised when you looked at those data points and did that baffle you when it comes to the temperature profiling? Um, in, in the case I can think of, no, it did seem pretty linear, actually, but, uh, but I can imagine cases where, where maybe it would, um, where it's not so linear. Right, right. So at least we had a huge surprise, especially in COM, when you're talking about production from higher temperatures. And again, back to the original question, do we know what the location and the drilling patterns or the slots of DVA wells are? Um, does it, has anyone thought about the heat sink? And what I can talk about is that when we looked at those temperatures, um, we were definitely surprised, pleasantly surprised. Um, and then we started looking at, uh, we, we basically went on a hunt of how many times in the field we have entered hydrate conditions for a particular well. And then we went on a hunt for that asset. Then we went on a hunt for the profile wide, and then it we went on. Then we did the risk assessment of how we thought about the gas liquid segregations and the profiles, the temperature profiles that we've been using. So we created a map of this is what we believe, and then we started looking at the data in the field, and our risk assessment matched with the excursions that we had had. And you'd be surprised, like we, uh, I think I can, there was one particular well where we had been going into hydrate conditions till 40, 45% water cut without any issues. And in our risk mapping, it came out as the one that should not have had any risk. And so it then from that exercise, then we felt very comfortable. Then we actually went on to make some guidelines around uh, how the well boards should be treated. What is our understanding? So things that to be looked out for. Liquid, gas liquid, emulsion tendencies. So combine all of the, those things. And I believe one can form the right risk identification and quantification matrix for those well bars. Ishan, the temperature profiles come from the production forecast and your local expert in well, well more, uh, and for Gulf of Mexico, you should, you guys have them there. At, West Hollow or somewhere in Houston, don't you? Uh, so Jeff, that would be a starting point. Um, trust me, generally those profiles, um, it's a heat transfer problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's all, they always give you the starting point and then they forget about it. 
<laughs> and we forget about it is what we've learned okay um so your boundary condition keeps on changing is also what that what we've learned yeah. uh, so it has definitely put us in a very different bracket of understanding uh, our temperature profiles for sure I just wanted to point out that generally, if you're designing for the life of the field and on the original uh, flow assurance design, you have to consider all of that because the, the things changing as function function of time. <laughs> yes, sir. That's the key. Things are changing as a function of time, and we have the tendency of using the report that came in flow assurance report during projects space. Yeah. So. Thank you, Jeff. Like that, that's, that should probably summarize for everyone what one needs to go back and do. Uh, yeah, and then start thinking, what, what do I actually need to form a plug in the well bore? Yes. <laughs> what do I need? Like if I have, so, and this is what the graph taught us. The BP work taught us that, okay, it seems like this is what you need. Can we push? and try to form at least some sort of a resistance to flow. Let's let's get to that point. We try, try, try. We figured out our envelope. We figured out our failure points. And at one point, it, there was one event. It was a high resistance flow. We And we, we have started to feel very comfortable. So I think start from this last question. What do I need in my well bore to be arranged in such a fashion that I can form a plug? I believe if you start from there, it's a great journey. Yeah, and then always the next question is, what I have learned from DVA wells, um, can I uh, can I extrapolate anything to sub C? Can I do that? How well can I do it? Uh, this is also another journey that one would go on. And I can tell you there's a lot that could be extrapolated. Um, and sub C wells are more forgiving than DVA. <laughs> so, uh, and just be very careful. Um, whatever I've talked about is shut in restarts and uh, steady state flows in the in, in the system. Uh, whenever you have an intervention, uh, this all goes down the drain. Just 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 be careful. Just have there is special considerations for sure when it comes to interventions. Squeeze, scale, soaks, and whatnot. Um, just be careful on that front. If nothing else, I would move on to the next one. Yeah, well head and jumpers. Um, does cool down time for a jumper or well head make sense to folks? It doesn't to me. I've still not been able to convince all the people back in our company. Um, but uh, let's start from the bottom one. Um, it's like, can can these items plug? I think they could. Again, what are what do I actually need in my wellhead and jumper to cause a plug? Yeah, I, I believe if you have gas and water sitting there, you definitely would. And I, I then maybe yes the um, the concept of cool down time makes sense. I believe for a black oil system, um, for me, the cool down time for jumpers is, uh, it's, it's a redundant idea. So um, think about our, the transit times that we have in jumpers, is that enough to, to form a plug, right? So let's say you have, harsh conditions during shut-in for jumper to be able to form a plug. So you will treat it. If it's treated, you're good to go, right? But if there are not harsh conditions, and if you will, you believe that you will not plug during a shut-in, then during a restart, is the transit times in jumpers enough to actually form a plug? That's where my brain is, and that's where I feel that I don't know how much value do we gain by insulating jumpers. And same goes for wellheads. Yeah. So 
starting from the bottom, coming back to the top, does methanol really flush the jumpers? Um, if you haven't pondered on this question, um, I think it's high time. <laughs> Please refer to both the work that Tulsa University has already done, and um, you might be able to, um, how do you say, recoin these terms into minimum treatment and whatnot. Um, do I really need two volumes, three volumes? And we definitely don't do that, is all I can say. Um, uh, and the connecting dot would be, is the 1D transient simulation in Olga that we do the right tool? Anyone willing to share what they, what's the uh, uh, norm that is followed? I can tell you the norm before 2013 we had. Insulate everything. Uh, Two to three volumes of uh, methanol. Um, if we think it doesn't follow any of our technologies, uh, uh, where the problem started getting uh, generating was if you have multiple subsea wells, you just don't have enough time to treat all of them because then the operator has to jump from one to the other to the other to the other, and there is just not enough time. So should one be focusing on on, on, on treating the jumper, or should one be focusing on bringing back the platform up? So everything that I will show you, the value is never in the chemical savings. The value is the man hours that instead of treating a risk where it might not even be the case, you could actually be spending that time in bringing back the platform up. Hey, Sean, just a, a point here. I, I think this is a, a real valid point. Um, I'll say one other thing that we've done to kind of manage this is um, if, if you have just a little bit of a slant to the jumper, you get very efficient sweeping of the jumper. So the whole two to three uh, volumes of guidance can also be really relaxed if you take that approach. Um, I, I think, think it's a fair, fair question. Do you really need to flush the jumpers at all? But um, we, there's also some other efficiencies I know that we've taken some credit for in our designs to mm -hmm. help get that more efficient sweep to keep from needing those higher volumes. And Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Flow line jumpers and, uh, and uh, well jumpers, I'm guessing, also have different numbers for you guys. Because that's what it came out for us as well. Mm -hmm because of their little bit difference in the geometry, M jumpers and U jumpers. Um, so yeah, something that I can definitely say on this platform is we don't even touch the one jumper volumes. It's everything is lower than that. And depending on what you're treating, um, we have saved a lot of time, a lot of time. And, and that's where the biggest win was for us. Thanks, Doug. Okay, if nothing else, I will move on to the flow lines. Okay, uh, and I think I th this was also vetted in the technology piece that I was talking about. Do all fluids need treatment? So this is where Hypro comes in and what's its limit? At what water cut you cannot rely upon this natural, uh, naturally occurring surfactant. Um, Depending on the fluid, again, we have a testing protocol. Our lab goes through a rigorous analysis. Um, I can tell you that this ranges. Uh, some fluids are only hypro till 5% water cut. Some fluids are uh, hypro till 44% water cut. Huh? It's, it's a range. It's a whole range. It completely depends on the fluid that you have at hand. Um, um, I don't know if other companies have their own programs related to this, um, but I, I believe I can talk about Hypro for a whole day. It's just something that we were exposed to when we joined Shell, and I do believe uh, it was the um, 2011 Edinburgh conference where we had presented this paper the first time. So that is definitely one of the strategies that gets used. Um, the other questions that I would tend to ask is, is your system gas limited? Is it liquid packed? Uh, so gas limited piece would come to, towards, we'll start moving towards loads, GOR items. 
um, is your system water limited? Do you actually have enough water, even if you convert all of that into a hydrate flood? Can we find those lower limits below which there is always a safe zone? Okay, so I can tell you, we do have those lower limits when it comes to water or GOR below which we don't do anything. Period. We don't treat our flow lines. We can let them sit for days, hours. Um, sometimes there is a there is a limit to time, depending on that limit of water or GOR, whatever it is. Um, sometimes the even the time limit is infinite. So uh, there's testing we go through. It's just that. Uh, the starting point is asking that question am i gas limited am i water limited what can i do from testing point to prove that i actually don't need to do anything um, yeah sorry i forgot there was an animation I'm a big fan um so yeah from 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 the from the starting point of what my fluids have uh, I guess that's more of a macro thing to look at, right? Uh, hypro is probably more micro, uh, but gas limited and water limited could easily be a very macro thing. So then we move into something that uh, we learned from Statoil, Equinor, uh, when they presented their paper on hydrate management in practice. And by the way, folks, if somebody has not read that or somebody has not tried to break this down, because this paper, I would, if I have to say anything, this paper is probably the Bible, the Gita, where you start from, and then you know somebody has done it, you know it's been achieved. Then again, go back to my first slide is, what do we need to do to achieve it? Because it's possible, yeah? So this is where we started. So is there a region inside hydrate conditions where we just can't form hydrates? So that paper from Keo Kinari, uh, the, the conditions that has been shown here is the green zone is where they could not find any crystallization of hydrates. Yellow is the where they crystallize and red definitely. So it's, it's, it's a time bound um, aspect. Like a green zone is basically, you don't even nucleate a hydrate, even if you sit there for a day, two days, three days, you just don't. And I believe yellow was if you crystallize in a day, Red is you immediately crystallize, right? So that's that's something that we wanted to understand. Um, we did our uh, homework, we did our testing and whatnot. Um, and this is something that I wanted to share. And we have a field data <laughs> to talk about it as well. Um, the graph that you're showing, sh seeing at the bottom is basically a summary of multiple restarts, multiple, five years of restart data of a flow line their time spent in uh, subcooling region and then there is a max subcooling shown now before you start wondering that why would one go and do this in the field before they've even developed a technology of their own it's a valid question what had happened here was we had started to water flood this field and the salinity had dropped we didn't realize i mean somebody was collecting the data our surveillance we were not smart enough to put all those pieces together till there was an event which is this shown in red um, if our pressure drop in that flow line during restart used to be 1000 to 1200 during this particular event our pressure drop in the field was closer to 2200 it lasted for several hours our boarding temperature was 40 fahrenheit for multiple hours we had never seen that, definitely operators pointed it out. They were able to restart though, but it caught our eye and then we started to go back and check what had happened. So for five years, we were, our hydrate curves had changed. We thought we had blown down to the right pressures and we are fine uh, given the hydrate curves. However, salinity had changed, hydrate curves had changed. We were in hydrate conditions for five years during shut-in without realizing. So that's the beauty of this restart data. 
Now, we also, why am I showing you this graph is because we use these two parameters in general to quantify the risk. Um, a lot of times what happens in the field is you invariably have an unplanned shut-in and some of the fields are in hydrate conditions. Um, and you can't have all the mitigation options that you had thought you would during certain events. So at that time you have to rank which one do I need to fix and which one can I let it be? We've been in that situation. Uh, if somebody else has, please share. Um, that's, that's, that's generally been the case for us. Um, and that's why for us, these two parameters are pretty, um, pretty powerful. Um, and if I am not wrong, hollow, yes. So I have given that as well. So yeah, all the hollow ones are the ones which have uh, time greater than five Fahrenheit subcooling. So we do use subcooling in different fashions and seeing which is more harmful or not. Um, so yeah, uh, we did this field experiment. Uh, the data was in front of us and we invariably realized that that experiment of what, what Keo was talking about, um, can you nucleate hydrates? Can you outrun hydrates? We had a solid field data and I'm not kidding. This flow line is greater than 15 miles. Yeah. Um, so this was our confidence builder to, to deploy the strategy. So we had were been working upon it. We had certain lab data. We had collaborated with the universities to create that data. Then came this aspect and we were like, oh, okay, here it is. <laughs> we believe we've already done this kind of implementation in the field. So can we have a green light? So we started getting some green lights on, okay, go and implement that thing in this way. Um, finally, other thing is, can we outrun the hydrates during, um, during restart, uh, depending on the kinetics um, and the fluid and flow line conditions? This has definitely enabled our single subsea tiebacks strategy. Uh, we are able to blow them down below hydrate conditions. And then during restart to avoid chili choke, we do pressurize. And you can imagine when you pressurize the flow line, you're putting it back into hydrate conditions. Um, so depending on the kinetics, depending on like, uh, I think Pat had an earlier question uh, about hydrate volume fractions. This is where all those things come into picture. How can I, how much can I actually form during this restart? Would methanol help during this kind of a restart? Sure. So those are certain strategies we combine for our um, flow line aspect. Any questions? I, I just popped one in there, Sean. Um, basically, I was I was seeing the sub cooling that you have in the table here. Um, and was thinking of the paper that Patrick Matthews had put out in the Warner Bully uh, test cases where it seemed like they were getting immediate onset at around six degrees Fahrenheit subcooling. It seemed fairly consistent with what you were seeing here. So I, I was wondering if you see something similar in other fields or is this just a unique opportunity that you're able to get, get this particular data and if you had any comments on how that might sure. relate. Right. So, Doug, we've moved to a strategy. We actually have a technology in place now for what you're seeing the graph above. So I completely agree with that. Like if there is a black oil system, you probably could live with five, six Fahrenheit uh, pieces. Um, and I, actually, I'm not too sure if this one includes the five Fahrenheit or I've removed the five. I'm forgetting now. <laughs> about this graph. So in very high probability, this subcooling is actually a plus five. So what you're seeing in the data, like the red one is almost 9.5. Uh, I think it is more like 14 Fahrenheit, but I can okay. confirm later on. However, uh, the bigger question you were asking, uh, yes, I think Patrick Matthews was on the right track. Uh, we do actually now have a technology of our own that can create the exact map that KO has on top. So depending on if a field is facing issues, you know, late life and whatnot, we now have this in place that we will generate this chart and then apply it accordingly. 
Great, thanks. That subcooling rule is if you're actually doing it in the lab, trying to manage the experiments and getting hydrates to form quickly, you have to drive off like 20 Fahrenheit to get it to really make sure it, it happens. Because I've seen tests that claim we wouldn't get hydrate formation, but the vendor didn't drive the uh, far enough below the uh, thermodynamic uh, onset point to get it to form short term. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yeah, uh, I think I have eight, yeah, six minutes more to go. Uh, let me be fast about it. Flow line, still flow line. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, when we are continuously in hydrated conditions, are LDHIs 100% effective? Has a, that is a question that I have uh, posed, and I I don't trust it. I, I if somebody asked me personally, I would say the answer is always no because multi-phase is at a play. Um, one of the examples that I could talk about is a failed implementation of hypro strategy in the field where our fluid were hypro, we thought LDHI and that for field had LDHI in place. So we thought if, if it's truly the same um, aspect, then this should work. Uh, we can probably stop LDHI. As soon as we stopped LDHI injection, we started plugging the field. Then we realized, well, okay, um, LDHI's carrier is methanol. Maybe that was also helping and whatnot. Um, then we decided to clean the plug that we had formed with methanol. When we cleaned that up, it turns out that our baseline pressure of the riser base decreased by 20%. And I say baseline, it was before we stopped injecting LDHI. To our amazement, we were always forming hydrates. We were always depositing hydrates. However, very little fraction. And this field was in production for eight to 10 months with a lot of ramp ups and shut-ins and whatnot. So your naked eye, we our naked eyes could not capture that. Um, and turns out this was happening for six to eight months, very slowly, methanol cleaned it up. Uh, then you always uh, start asking that question. Uh, if, do I need to inject LDHI? Can I turn into a batch methanol strategy? Can, because I can save a lot of cash there. Um, how much, how, what frequency is okay by operation? So different aspects. But uh, if, if, if you guys are using LDHIs um, continuously for, for a field that is in hydrate conditions, um, just, just to, I guess, just something to be to be aware of, or something to take into consideration. Um, are you causing any deformment because you have a back pressure and you've not realized that it exists? Uh, I think this probably is the final. Slide. Yeah. So, uh, if you see this slide, Ishan. Uh... Giovanni asked if uh, you were referring to AA when you were talking about LDHI. Yes, it is anti-agglomerant. Yes. Thanks, Giovanni. Keeping it real. Um, yeah, uh, I guess a quick question. When you see this kind of a graph, and if you don't think it's a numerical diffusion and it's not a modeling thing, and if I want you to focus on the lower ones, what do you think is happening at, say, when you look at the red curve, you see here, what do you think happened at this point of time? And what do you think is happening again at this point of time? Anyone, wild guess, let's do it. If you're thinking we moved the choke, you're thinking wrong. <laughs> Okay. Maybe slugging? So this is definitely slugging, Taras. I, I guess the question I'm, I'm trying to ask is, why do you think the slugging went away? Why do you think it's reappearing? Okay. This is the same field, guys, the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, this is actually hydrates. This is how hydrates were manifesting themselves. So. 
we went from a strategy of continuous LDHI uh, or anything else continuous to, to let form the hydrates. We wanted to see what's our potential, what can we do till what point can we handle it. Um, all I can say is that methanol injection subsided slugging. Now, you, there are multiple ways, right? You could think about hydrates, there's uh, uh, change in the phase behavior, deposition, diameter change, viscosification of the slurry. Um, this is something that I had pointed out. And one of the things that I was doing during my PhD was how hydrates as a phase can impact the multi-phase flow piece. Um, this was one of the simulations from the thesis, which talks about uh, after a couple of seconds, how those slugging manifests into your flow line. Um, I was just pleasantly like a small kid laughing on the side as like, hey, I told you so, kind of a moment for me when I saw this happening in the field. Um, every single time we would inject methanol, uh, this would just go away and this would start to form again. So yes, uh, I do believe that there is a clear interdependence of hydrates and multiphase flow now. <laughs> Uh, export line. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I could rush. Dr. Sum, do I have time or let's finish it? Uh, you can keep going, but you know, that's okay. That's not a problem. Okay. I do have 10 minutes available. I can, I'll, I'll go through it. Um, for gas exports line, um, I guess the starting question is always, do we trust the water spec measurements? Um, I, I, I would say I don't. Um, we've been burnt by it as well. Um, so that's our um, experience. Anyone else willing to share around the export lines? Hey, Sean, we've been working on the water sol solubility in propane and CO2 for about five years. The measurements are extraordinarily difficult to do. So I, I agree that we have trouble measuring values to use in field applications and mm -hmm. probably need to find a way to calculate this reliably. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, probably uh, if, if one is looking for, I, I would say um, keeping a check on or on the health of your glycol system can create correlations on the water spec measurements. That is something that we've learned. Um, yeah, but I guess the bigger piece is if the off-spec excursion does occur, do we need to do anything um, right away? So something that I was able to convince um, operations was, again, um, uh, one project that was part of my graduate thesis was how do hydrates form in the gas systems? Very applicable to export lines. Um, this is something, this is again a simulation uh, based on a model, based on um, experiments that we had done, was but showing you how, how if you have a saturated gas flowing in a cold export line, uh, what sort of deposition you could, you could see in the system. So it's showing you that in 10 days, you have um, this 15 millimeters, 16, 17 millimeter of thickness, and that's the profile. Um, does that warrant any treatment when it comes to um, do I need to mitigate it? Do you really need to mitigate it is the question. Um, and I can say we have a guideline now in place in Shell for export line excursions, which does not talk about, which definitely does not talk about mitigating excursions immediately. We have time bound, um, we have uh, um, concentration and the amount of off spec bound, um, specifications in there. Um, so we, uh, the convincing argument worked that there is time before we need to do anything. Now, once I say that, it's a very diff different proposition from a field that has a pigging plan for their export systems because it definitely changes the game. You might not treat the system and if you have a pig going in, I have two separate examples. You can plug the line. Yes, this is the asset where we could not figure out what the off spec was because we were measuring one to two pounds per million scuff, but for two pig runs, we, 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 we had hydrate particles on the other side 
uh, when the pig was recovered, there was hydrate slush on the other side collected. So we knew in a way that there is some excursion happening. However, we were unsure how much excursion and when. So we had normalized the risk that it's been fine. These three pig runs are fine. The fourth one would also be fine. We plug the pig. And I'm pretty sure it was a saturated system and the pig I think was going every 14 days. So you can imagine it might have scraped all of that deposit and pushing in front of it. And at one point of time, just plug. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you want to treat before picking? What should be your schedule? Another way we got burned is you could treat, but where does methanol go? Can it evaporate? Does it go to the parts that you want the system to be treated? Be very careful if the export line is to be picked, is what I've learned. Anything else anyone wants to share or any questions on this one? Maybe just a very brief comment on this methanol reaching and staying in the parts where you want it to be. The topic was uh, unexpected accidental hydrogen mediations. Another line in Canada, also sub C, uh, had uh, shut in and uh, they did inject methanol at the riser, but it wasn't distributed. It was a shutdown uh, of the whole facility. They managed to add some flow of gas into that line, which did cause the batch or the slug of methanol to reach into the subsequent low spots. So again, by accident, they did manage to inhibit their system. Mm. Just an example. Right. And as an accident, how we plugged this system, Taras, the second one was we actually treated the system. And uh, we treated the system, but our pigging schedule was after four days. So let's say excursion, bad excursion happened for three days. So we treated it. And then once we got back on track, there was four days gap. And then we were going to pick the line. To everyone's amazement, or obviously it's an after learning, in those four days, almost all the methanol evaporated. It got preferentially picked up by the gas. We had never thought of this problem. So we've plugged two export systems in the past five years. One I already told you about the scraping from the wall. The other was the risk identification. We failed at it. We thought that once you've treated the system, you are fine and now you're flowing the gas and it's okay. However, later on, <laughs> once we had plugged, when we did our simulation, dynamic simulation, turns out your methanol gets preferentially picked up. So that's why the schedule is important. Okay. Um, I guess the four last discussion points, this is, this is, this is my last slide, guys. So uh, I believe we tend to be very conservative in the field, which is very understandable, right? Hydrates are something that are unforgiving. Hydrates are, uh, you have less time, uh, but uh, I think not questioning the norms is probably the worst we can do. It's, it's, there's no favors done to engineering or our degrees or something that we've spent time on. Uh, the best way is to question the norm and see, are we um, identifying the risk again in the right fashion? Are we quantifying it in the right fashion? And is that risk being communicated to the leadership, the decision makers at the end in the right fashion? Uh, for me, that has always been the trick. Um, lab work, I, I went through a, a cycle of, and I was in lab, loved the lab work. Initially then went into projects and stuff. Uh, I was not a big fan of lab work. First year of operations, I was not a big fan of lab work. By the end of it, I, I really enjoy that there is, you can test your intuitions in the lab. I'm not going to blindly extrapolate things in the lab, but it allows you to see, is this really happening? Or is this something that I'm, is there something I'm missing? I think you can learn from the lab and design an experiment then for the field. Um, 
I did some more forgiving. I think I've already mentioned these three bullets of risk part. Um, finally, the most of the plugs that we've formed, if not export lines, what have I seen have been interventions. I know I could have I just didn't have enough time. Yeah. So I've kept interventions out of today's talk, but they are also one of the most difficult ones. It's the risk identification piece that generally gets missed out in intervention. So with that, yep, that was the last slide. Thanks a lot, Ishan. That it was a great, uh, I think very informative. Uh, you know, you touch upon the things that uh, we typically don't talk about or don't get to uh, share. Um, we are about, uh, beyond the hour, but uh, certainly uh, uh, if you have time, uh, and people uh, have questions in here. Uh, um, anyone uh, would like to uh, ask something to Ishan or make a comment, uh, you can send a chat or raise your hand. Yeah, I'm available for another five, 10 minutes. Um, I, I don't mind staying online. Ishan, I had a question, kind of a comment also. Um, you talked about one of the main ingredients needed for forming hydrates being gas. And in my experience, I, I think there needs to be a distinction that we're really talking about just sufficient enough of hydrate formers. I've, I've seen a case uh, or we've, we've worked some cases where they're very high pressure cases, but as, as a result, it basically just is very low GOR, right? Um, we, but even so, we have an awful lot of hydrate forming components and we've been able to convert you know, as high as 25% um, water cut or 25% hydrate fraction or so based off of a system with no gas presence at all. So I, I just wanted to get your comments on that. I, I, I think in my opinion, it kind of needs to be qualified when we're talking about gas that we're really talking about those hydrate components and not necessarily a free gas phase, right? Uh, so yes, to form hydrates, I completely agree. I, I think I misspoke there. It should be hydrate forming components, right? Uh, I do have a different thought process around when can you plug though. Mm -hmm. So uh, for plugging, especially during sh shut-in, like, so I treat shut-in and restarts different operations because there is a very different conditions and whatnot. I do feel that to plug a system during a shut-in, you actually need gas and water to be in direct contact. Um, even your oil otherwise can play a barrier fill, right? Because you are shut in in that in that in that uh, situation. Um, so it just brings a different risk appetite, is is all I can say um, when it comes to uh, the, the the kinetics we are dealing with is yes, you can form hydrates for sure, like higher pressures, low GORs, but will those hydrate components be sufficient during your kinetic event of restart? Can you outrun this? So that, it's a combination, yeah? However, I would never mess with the system, for example, a gas system or more to not of a black oil. Um, and that's what I was talking about. Like if you have, you think there could be a gas water contact very less liquid or very less oil layer in jumpers. I'm pretty sure even jumpers can plug at that point of time. Um, but so, so yeah, you can form hydrates, um, but plugging is where the, the, the main action is, I guess. In the, in the shut-in case, aren't you still with oil in equilibrium with the, with the water phase? Then you're yes. still it's still competing with the oil for the hydrate formers because you got to right. saturate the system too. Yeah, so you can probably form a film, but after that, what do you do? Like your oil phase is devoid of gas, so that needs to get saturated, and then uh, so yeah, it's. Uh, production of KHI and AA is used more in actual production. Um, which of KHI and AA? We use AAs, I believe, far more than KHI. 
Uh, I think one of the fields coming up in Trinidad and Tobago would be using KHI and A's are just not an option. But yes, in Shell, A's are more uh, prevalent in Gulf of Mexico, as Taras pointed out. Any other questions? Well, I don't see anyone else in here. Uh, we are at, uh, I think, uh, you know, 15 minutes here past uh, the hour. So uh, um, we are gonna try to conclude then uh, this webinar that again was very informative. I appreciate uh, Ishan, you taking the time and putting all these thoughts together and sharing with us. Uh, this uh, uh, webinar uh, is recorded and it will be later posted in our uh, website uh, if anyone would like to go back and revisit uh, the things that Ishan have uh, discussed today. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Sum and the organizing committee. And uh, I feel privileged because probably uh, my age is equal to a lot of people who already have either presented or are on the call and have that much of experience. So I do feel privileged to be able to present to these folks. I, I think uh, it is invaluable that the uh, uh, field of uh, experience that you have, uh, you know, there is a very good turnout uh, to your webinar. And so uh, it certainly uh, speaks to uh, uh, what you can bring to the table. All right, everyone, uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll conclude the webinar here. And uh, thanks for participating. Our next one is in two weeks. Uh, and uh, we'll be sending out more information about the next speaker. Thanks again. Have a good day, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, all.